to 25 for the last few Sundays. And we are on verse 31. Um, parable about the final judgment. And um, as we turn to God's word, can we all stand together in reverence for the word? We'll be looking at Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 through 46. 31 through 46. This is the word of God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, You did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have led us through uh, the series in the, in the parables. The parables are wonderful stories that have captured our, our minds and our, our imaginations uh, to speak about glorious truths, about your kingdom, about grace, about heaven. And so many of these parables have been sobering, but they're also saving and sanctifying. And God, as we come to this parable, we pray that, uh, again, we would have ears to hear what you have to say. This is uh, a story that that speaks of very weighty things. So God, we pray that we would give full attention to your word at this time. And won't you bless us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you're just joining us, we, ha- we have been going through a series on the parables of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, when he taught, he told a lot of stories to teach about the kingdom and, and about truth and, and about heaven. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I have. And today we come to the last parable of this series. So this series is coming to a close. And in Matthew's gospel in particular, this is the last parable that Jesus spoke. This is the last one. And this parable is part of this mini three part, 
three parable series in chapter 25, and it's all about Jesus' return. And uh, so far, we've covered uh, the idea that we need to be watchful for the last day. Uh, We don't know the hour, the day or the hour in which Jesus is going to come, but we need to be watchful. We need to be ready. But also, we need to be faithful. We saw that last week. We need to be faithful in our preparation for that last day. And it's here, as we come to this passage that we just read, that where Jesus takes time to tell us what that last day is going to be like. What is it going to be like when he returns? And Jesus says that on the last day, the Son of Man, he's going to come, and he's going to come in glory. Now, the way Jesus uh, says it, he says, when the Son of Man comes in glory, that means he's coming. It's not if he's going to come, but when he comes, He's going to come. And when he comes, he's going to come in glory. And if any of you have read uh, the book of Revelation, you know that in chapter 1, the apostle John gets a little preview of the glory of Jesus as the Son of Man. And Jesus' glory is just so bright, so radiant, that what does John say? He says, when I saw him... I fell at his feet as though dead. It just about knocked him out. Jesus' glory was that great. And you know, Jesus' glory, it'll be so transcendent. It'll be so awesome that it's going to overwhelm us. Why will it overwhelm us? Because we will feel so sharply his greatness and our smallness, his divinity and our humanity, his kingship, in our servitude, his strength, and our weakness. And it's the kind of glory that will cause us to collapse and fall on our faces. We'll be overwhelmed. And Jesus says that he'll basically have this holy entourage of angels, multitudes, upon multitudes who will be coming with him, that will be surrounding him, and it's just going to be so clear that here's the king, that he has arrived. Um, have you guys ever saw those clips of guys getting, to, getting into like these exclusive parties and then they get in there by, by having a, a fake entourage with them? And, and when they go in, it's like all the security people are, are like, well, he has this entourage. Well, of course this guy is important, right? And in the same way, when we see the entourage, the holy entourage of angels, we're going to be like, this is the king. The king has come. And Jesus says that he will sit on his glorious throne as the king, and he's going he's to take his rightful place. And Jesus will show himself to be the son of man in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel gets a vision of the son of man. And who is that son of man? The king of kings. Jesus says, I'm going to come, and I'm going to come as the king of kings. And as the king of kings, he's going to gather all the nations before him. Because he's the king. And it's interesting to think about it like that, to have this, this, this vision of Jesus gathering all the nations. You know, there's, there's something that we have in common with, like, for example, the farmer, like in a village in western China, and us. We're all ultimately under the same king. King Jesus. And he's going to gather all the nations together, and as he gathers them, what is he going to do? He's going to start separating people. Just like a shepherd separates sheep and goats. And let's be mindful of this, that he separates people into two groups. Not three, not four, not five, but two groups. The sheep and the goats. There's no nuance here. There's no, like, neutral third group, right? There's, there's no group for, okay, nice people who were good without God, so to speak, or another group of people who were uh, religious but just didn't believe in Jesus, right? Or another group, they believe in God but not Christ. No, there's going to be only two groups, the sheep and the goats. Believers and followers of Christ and the rest. 
And the fate of the sheep and the goats could not be more different. For the sheep, the words are wonderful. What does it say in verse 34? Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The words are going to become and inherit. And it's crazy to think that we're inheriting something that's been prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Do you realize that once we inherit the kingdom, once we have heaven, we're going to have such a deep sense that this is home, that this is where we were always meant to be. Heaven is our home. And not only are we going to inherit the kingdom, this is going to be something for eternity. The sheep will be set aside for eternal life. But what about the goats? The words there are scary. Depart from me, verse 41, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so the sheep go to eternal life and the goats to eternal fire. And later on in verse 46, into eternal punishment. And I want us to pause there. Let's look at verse 46. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is one of the places where we get the understanding that hell is eternal. I think there are Christians today who begin to think that maybe hell is not eternal, maybe it's something else. And here Jesus speaks so clearly, and these will go away to eat into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If hell is not eternal and eternal does not mean eternal, then neither is heaven eternal. There's parallel here, but in the opposite direction. Now on the flip side, if heaven is eternal, and it is, well, so is hell. We've been talking about hell quite a bit, and only because in the parables it seems to show up almost every time at the end. And we find that hell is horrible. And the pictures of hell that Jesus gives us in the parables are not even the reality. They're pictures and symbols that point to the reality. The reality is worse. The reality is more awful. And on top of it, we learn here that it is eternal. And this is not an easy doctrine. I would say this is probably one of the hardest doctrines that we as Christians believe in. This isn't the kind of doctrine any man would make up. This is truths that come from heaven. And for us as Christians, we only believe this because Jesus taught it. But there are reasons why it makes sense that hell would be eternal and one thing that I mentioned I think in in a previous sermon is that those in hell continue to sin they don't stop sinning they actually sin in greater ways pastor how do you know that they sin what does Jesus say they weep that they go into a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth That's anger. That's fury. And that's anger towards a person, to God. And so as sin persists in hell, so does punishment persist. Because God's justice demands it. One theologian once said that just as for us, The sanctifying desires and the new heart that God has given us like fully blooms in heaven where we're perfected. So in the same way, 
those in hell, the sin in their hearts and in their lives fully grows to its full effect. And so hell is eternal. And if we think about it another way, our offenses are against an eternal king who is infinitely perfect and infinitely righteous. The greater the person that we offend, the greater the offense, and the greater the offense, the greater the punishment. Right? It's one thing to not listen to your friend. It's another thing to not listen to, the, to, to your police officer. Right? It's one thing to strike a stranger in a conflict. It's another thing to strike your parent. Now think about it in terms of God, the eternal king, and what kind of offense we have committed when we sin against God. There's some theologians who say, the eternal fires of hell forever don't even capture our crimes and our guilt for sinning against God. And so hell, we see, is eternal. You know, when we grow up in life, we grow up not wanting to be in the wrong group, right? In the beginning in, in, in school, it's like, gosh, I want to make sure I'm in the cool group, not in the uncool group, right? You always want to be found in the fun group, not the, not the boring group, the talented group, not the ordinary group. You want to be with the starters on your team, right? Not on the bench. You get older, you want to be part of the rich crowd, not the poor people. But Jesus says, hey, slow down. When you think about groups and two groups and wanting to be in the right group and not being in the wrong group, this is the one that you need to think about most. You do not want to find yourself in the wrong group that is being among the goats on that last day, and the stakes couldn't be any higher. There's nothing more frightening than Jesus sending us to the goats when he returns. And on the flip side, there's nothing more wonderful than Jesus sending us among the sheep when he returns. And so Jesus here, he, he presses us to respond to the realities of what's going to happen on the last day. And if we're listening to Jesus, and if we're attentive to Jesus, then we're asking the question of, who is a sheep, and am I a sheep? And what marks a sheep? We should be asking that question. And Jesus tells us, tells us what the mark of a sheep is. He talks about how the sheep are the righteous. Now today, everyone has their own idea about what it means to be righteous. A lot of times, being righteous means having a particular stance on a particular issue. Being righteous means uh, supporting a certain cause, participating in a certain movement, belonging to a certain political party. Who are you, who'd you vote for? Like, that's, that's righteousness. But Jesus comes in here today and into our lives, and he settles the debate, and he says, this is what it means to be righteous. And then starting in verse 35, he says, I was hungry. And I was thirsty. And I was a stranger, right? And I was naked, I was sick, and I was a prisoner. And you ministered to me. And the righteous will say, God, when did we ever do that? And, he said, and he'll say, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The high mark of righteousness is mercy. To care for the least, to care for the lowly and the last. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is a great list to start with. Who are the righteous? It's those who provide for the hungry, and the thirsty, who welcomed the stranger or, you know, the new guy. Those who provide clothing for the naked, who provide warmth and shelter for those who need it. Who are the righteous? Those that visit the sick, those that visit those in prison. 
people who are isolated and suffering, those are his sheep. And then who are the goats? It's those who have not shown mercy. And something needs to be said there. Righteousness is not just avoiding evil. Oh, I I don't do drugs. I don't steal. I don't lie. You know, all that kind of stuff. Right? That's part of righteousness. But also righteousness is doing good. Doing acts of mercy. That also is righteousness. And that is a mark of righteousness. So mercy, that is caring for the least. It is fundamental in the kingdom of God. It's so basic that if you're not engaging in mercy, then Jesus is recommending to you right now to reevaluate your faith. This is a mark of the kingdom and of his sheep. And for the parents who are listening here, we got to bring this into our parenting. Like how much, for example, do we value mercy and compassion versus ambition and competitiveness? How much do we value in our kids them helping others versus them achieving things? This is a good word for us. Jesus says mercy is what we do as Christians. But isn't it true that sometimes the, even the world shames us, that, that the world outdoes the church in mercy? And let that never be the case. You know, middle class American Christianity, for middle class American Christianity, doing mercy is often doing it once a year. Like every Thanksgiving, going to the local soup kitchen, and then it's like, oh, I've checked the box. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you've done that, I think that's great. But if that's all we do as Christians, we have, we have a big problem. Now, when Jesus talks about those who are among the goats, you know, verse 44, then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we not see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Do you know what that word minister is? In Greek, it's the same Greek word uh, diakonos. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like deacon. That's where we get the word deacon. It's the verb form of deacon. Minister to you. This is where we get the understanding of what deacons do in the church. They serve the least. The poor, the stranger, the sick, the lonely, and the suffering. Where am I going with this? If mercy is a basic part of the kingdom of God, then the office of deacon is very important in the church. Very important. If we don't think we need deacons or if we don't have deacons, then we're in a load of trouble as a church. The church will not be strong and healthy. The church will lose its vitality. Mercy is part of what makes the church such a special place. We need deacons. I'm so thankful for the deacons that we do have. Deacon Dan and Deacon Matt, they help our church do diaconal things, to do things like this that are so basic and essential to the kingdom of God. And I just want to say this. When the deacons bring up needs in the church, we as congregation members need to listen and to respond to it. They are leading the way for us to be a church of mercy. And so I hope we don't think about, you know, when, when the deacons ask us for help, that it, these are like optional things. No. As they are officers in the church, we should listen and we should respond. There may be some of you going, okay, how do I get started? Because, wow, that, Jesus is saying some pretty plain things that the mark of his sheep is mercy. Right? So how do I get started? And I just want to say this. You don't have to go to like skid row after service today. If you want to, that's great, but you don't have to. Don't think you have to start off, uh, you know, trying to do something spectacular tomorrow. I think sometimes when we get into that place, 
it's never sustainable, right? I'll, I'd like to recommend some things. You can start by welcoming the stranger among us here, right here at church. On any given Sunday, there's, there are people who are new. They've either been here, for, they've come here for the first time, or maybe it's the second or third time. And it's not easy being the new person. You know, some of us, we forget what it's like to be the new person. You know, you're, you're in a room full of people, but no one's talking to you, and you're all alone. That's awkward. That's uncomfortable. And so we could start right here on a Sunday. Now, some of us think that some people just have a knack for welcoming the stranger. And so it's like, well, let's just leave it to them to, you know, to welcome the stranger. They do a good job. But the mercy of welcoming a stranger, that's not for the gifted. It's the mark of a Christian. It's the mark of a Christian. I know there's some of us here, we don't really like the fellowship time that, that's right after service. Maybe some of you are introverted. You don't know what to do with yourself. Um, maybe you still feel like you're the new person. I'd like to recommend something. How do you get out of that awkward situation? Make it a point after service to identify anyone who you see who might be new. Welcome them. Talk to them. Do that. I am thankful when I think about our church that we, we do engage in mercy. Um, I think we're fairly welcoming, and I hope it stays that way. Um, and, I, and I do want to take a t- this time to kind of highlight opportunities, even within our church, to do acts of mercy, and especially for those who, you, you know, you don't know where to start. One of them is providing rides to people to, to get to church. You know, those people who are strangers, who are new to the area, usually they don't have rides, right? Now, you might not think it's much to give someone a ride, but someone who needs a ride, that's everything to them. Remember that. I just want to give out a huge thank you to those who quietly give people rides on Sundays, every Sunday. You know, we have a nursing home ministry. That's ministering to people who are Widows, lonely, sick, suffering. Um, I always say this, but elderly people, I think, are the most forgotten people in society. Um, The click tutoring that we've been doing, ministering to kids in this underserved area, that's also a great opportunity. Some of you are familiar with the refugee ministry that we are a part of. Just last week, I had a chance to... uh, Talked to uh, Freddie. He was a Cuban refugee that we've been ministering to. Had coffee with him. Doing, doing so well now. Um, even his parents from Cuba are now here with him. And, and yeah. And I was just so blessed by the things he said. He said, Andy, man, I still remember those early days. Sleeping on the streets, homeless. And then, you know, I met you guys. <laughs> and then, you know, that was such a big help. Saved my life. And like, look. Look now, I'm, you know, I'm established. And, and it's such a privilege to be a part of that, you know, kind of ministry. Um, the opportunities are there. I, I hope we can take advantage. And so we see mercy. It's at the heart of the, of the Christian. Think about the Beatitudes that are basically a portrait of a Christian. And what's one of them? Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. So it needs to be a basic part of us, a, a basic part of our life and our faith. And I think maybe God is challenging some of us because it's, that's kind of been the neglected part of your discipleship and your faith. Like, you come to church and like, yeah, I love music. I love singing, right? Oh, I love, I love the relationships and the fellowship. And, you know, I love a good Bible study or, you know, a good sermon. But there are some of you where mercy is missing, or it's sorely lacking. And if that's the case, when you read the words of Christ from here, it's, it kind of shocks us, doesn't it? I think it unsettles us in a good way, challenges us. I think sometimes 
you know, for us, we just get so used to, like, just how we do, do faith. You know, mercy opportunities arise. We hear it from church or in other places, but you just, you've just gotten a habit. You just, you just ignore it. It's like, no, that's, that's not what I do. I'm not gifted. Yeah, those other people, they, you know, they all, they're always doing that, but that's, that's, that's not my thing. You know, I'll serve in other ways, that kind of thing. But I fear that there are some of you who are going to have that mindset to the end of your life. And when Jesus comes, you're going to be shocked when he says, to my left. And I don't want that for anybody. Jesus is saying that mercy is such a part of our discipleship as followers of Jesus Christ. How does Jesus know that, oh, this person is one of mine, one of my sheep, one of the righteous, one who will be inheriting the kingdom? He'll be looking for that mercy. Mercy. You know, why does Jesus speak so strongly about mercy as a mark of his people? Well, I want you to look carefully or think carefully about the different examples there. Whether it's the hungry, the thirsty, right? The naked, the sick. Think about all of them. Brothers and sisters, are they all not metaphors of the gospel? When you think about it, we were hungry. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We were thirsty. He said, I am the living water. We were strangers to God. And through Christ, we've been made friends of God, brought into the household of faith. We were naked and full of shame, and he clothed us with his righteousness. We were sick. We were sin-sick sinners. And Jesus is our great Physician. We were in prison, in the invisible prison of our sin, suffering in our, in our miseries, and Jesus has set us free. We know hunger if we're gospel people. We know thirst. We know what it means to be naked, to be the stranger, to be sick to be in a prison. We know that. So that when we see the hungry, we see the thirsty, we are looking in a mirror, we can see ourselves. And when we see those people, it does something to us. It causes us to remember our own salvation. It causes us to remember the gospel that we believe upon and that we've been blessed by. And we remember what Christ has done for us, right? that he showed mercy to us in our need, in our desperation, and in our misery. We are recipients ourselves of mercy. And that is why we are so compelled to show mercy to other people. Romans 15, 7. What does the Apostle Paul say? Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Why do we welcome the stranger? Because Christ has welcomed us when we ourselves were strangers. Let me put it another way. People who believe in the gospel reenact the gospel. People who truly believe in the gospel will reenact the gospel. It is not gifted people who engage in mercy. It's gospel people who engage in mercy. Those of the kingdom will be like the king. And I know a lot of times we we have our excuses ready in our back pocket to excuse ourselves from mercy, but I think when we think about how these are metaphors of the gospel, it challenges us, right? Because sometimes we're like, okay, I'm going to help this person out, I'm going to show mercy, but what are they going to do with it? Are they going to take advantage of me? What are the, you know, will they stay in their old ways? Will they change? Because if they don't change, I don't know if I'm going to give them mercy. 
Can you imagine if God asked those same questions to us? What are some other things we think about? Well, they they, they did it to themselves. That's self-inflicted right there. They don't deserve mercy. They need to pick themselves up by their bootstraps, get it together. That's what they need. Can you imagine if God said that to us? If God thought the way that we think, none of us would have been shown mercy. None of us. But thank God that he's not like us. That his ways are higher than our ways. Brothers and sisters, when we see the least and we don't feel, we don't act, it tells us that the gospel has either shallow roots in our hearts or we've somehow distanced ourselves ourselves from the gospel. Mercy is one of those gospel measures in, in, in your life. Are you a believer in the gospel? Okay, well, let's measure that. Let's use mercy as a measure. And that's what Jesus is doing with us today. Mercy is not a side thing, not a peripheral thing. Jesus says it's, it's a main thing. It's a main thing. Both in our lives and in our church, too. When we love the least, we imitate God's own love for, for us. And then I think of Jesus' words here, closing here. He says, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Jesus has such a great love for the least that it's so much so that he identifies with them, right? When we see Christ in those that are the least, when we see that service to them is service to Christ our Lord, and that when we love and honor them, that we are loving and honoring Christ. Do you realize how precious it is in God's sight when we serve the least and when we show mercy? It's so precious to God that basically God is saying here, I remember all of that. Every time you do that, I remember it. Trust me. And the thing about mercy is so many times it's hidden. Nobody knows you did it. It's quiet. It's really not spectacular. You know? There's no spotlight on you when you're doing it. But you know there's a spotlight from heaven? God loves it when we show this kind of mercy. And he's like, he has done this to me. That's how much it means to God. And when we show mercy, God sees his reflection in us. And it puts a smile on his face. God is the king of mercy. And so, brothers and sisters, as we've received it, let us now give it. And let's prove ourselves to be sheep. And so that when that last day comes and when Jesus returns, it's going to be an awesome day for us. It's going to be a joyous day. And we'll hear those wonderful words from Christ. Come and inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Enter into eternal life. Let's pray. Oh, Father, your kingdom is a kingdom of mercy. We forget sometimes that our king is the king of mercy and that we ourselves have been recipients of mercy. And God, I pray that your, your Holy Spirit would, would, would take the gospel that we love and that we believe in and, and take it deep into our hearts, moving us to reenact the gospel out into the world. And in particular, to those who are the least among us. Oh God, won't you give us compassionate eyes that gravitate towards the least and the lowly and the last. 
Oh God, give us your eyes. Give us, give us your heart. Let us be like you. Let us imitate you. And God, I pray that as you had such joy over us in showing us mercy, that we too would have joy in showing others mercy. And God, we look forward to that day when you will come again to see you in all your glory and all your beauty and to hear those words of grace and salvation. We look forward to that. And while we wait, God, we pray that we would show ourselves to be your people, to be among your sheep, to be busily doing acts of mercy for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name.